Okay. Good morning, all you beautiful people. Just my children and my wife Thank my lucky stars To be living here today Cause the flag still stands for freedom And they can't take that away And I'm proud to be an American Where at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the men There ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA From the lakes of Minnesota To the hills of Tennessee Across the plains of Texas from sea to shining sea From Detroit down to Houston And New York to L.A. There's pride in every American heart And it's time we stand and say
today Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the Sunglasses on the brim of her head Smoke was pouring from that old Cadillac But she wasn't turning back
Good morning, First Baptist Church. How are we this morning? All right. Is everybody enjoying their July 4th weekend? <laughs> I keep waiting. Well, I was about to say waiting for somebody's car to die from honking their horn too much, but we actually have already had that happen, haven't we? So I guess I won't jinx us with that. You know, for, for so many years now, we've celebrated our freedom on July 4th. We used to celebrate our freedom on July 4th. Now, we have a government that tells us when we can or we can't leave our houses, if and how we can worship. The state of California just banned singing in church. They tell us that we can't earn a living for our own families. And at the same time, they're protecting the ability of others to not pay attention to anything they tell us we have to do. They protect them to loot and to steal and to destroy other people's property and even, even to commit violence against other people's lives. Now, I fear that we are perilously close to only commemorating the freedom that we used to have in this country. If God is willing that our freedom would be restored to us, it is going to take good people of all races, all ethnicities, all backgrounds to stand up together in love against anarchy and tyranny and chaos and oppression, and violence. God is up to the task. As Christians, his people, pray that we are up to the task as well. I think we are. And we have seen God work through us before. This weekend has another anniversary. 18 years ago, July 3rd, 2002, is when lightning struck that steeple and burned the sanctuary. This church has been through a lot since that time. I looked back. Norma dug out some old articles for me, and, and she found those for me. The, uh, the Carroll County News headline referring to the, the fire had an article quoting the pastor, Steve Stevenson at the time, and what he said was, we will emerge from this stronger and closer. I hope that sounds familiar. That's what God does. He works all things together for the good of those who love him. This pandemic and this quarantine are no different. We're still thankful to him in the midst of all this for growth, even if it was hard. We grow stronger as we learn to trust him more. And we learn to trust him more with every situation that he walks alongside us through. And we continue to celebrate his continuing work in our lives and the life of this church. Amen? I really don't want this to get off on a, a sour note uh, as we're struggling with our freedoms in the midst of this current situation. We still live in an amazing country and we are still more free than almost anyone else in this world and we still have so much to be thankful for uh, when it comes to our freedom. So on this July 4th weekend, let's continue to worship uh, through song. So if you will, let's join Becky in singing this morning.
Thank you, Becky. Our scripture this morning is from the book of John, chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Heavenly Father, we come to you on this weekend, this morning, this beautiful morning on July 4th weekend. Father, there are so many, I think, mixed emotions 
swirling around in so many of us. We have frustration, we have anger, we have excitement, we have appreciation. And Lord, we're just trying to make sense of all of it in a world that makes no sense. Lord, help us as we find ourselves in this fallen world that makes no sense. Help us to be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. Lord, let our lives be guided by your love in all that we do. Help our, our speech to show forth in that love. Help our actions to show forth in that love. Father, just let us be people who are known because of our love. Father, help us to seek ways for reconciliation, to build bridges, Father, to connect with people and ultimately to share the gospel message and the impact that it has not only on people's lives, but just in this world. There is simply nothing more powerful in this world than the gospel message. Jesus Christ has done it all. Help us to share that. Father, we lift up this morning all those who are suffering. Father, those who have various illnesses, other health concerns uh, that are struggling emotionally and certainly struggling spiritually as well. Lord, we ask that you would make yourself known in each of those situations, that you would provide healing, that you would provide comfort and peace and assurance where it is needed. Lord, that in every situation, that that situation would be used to bring somebody closer to you. Father, if they don't know you, to bring them to know you. If they do know you, to know just how much they can trust you and how much you love them. Father, we just pray that all things would be done for your glory and honor. Lord, we'll collect our tithes and offerings uh, at the end of this service, but we ask your blessing on our money as well. Uh, those things that we give back a portion of to you, we pray that they would be used for your kingdom purposes, Father. Again, for love and reconciliation. And Lord, as we continue our worship this morning, uh, again in song, we just ask that you continue to open our hearts and open our minds to worship and to the message that you have for us. We pray all of these things in Jesus' precious, precious name. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we want to thank you today, dear Lord, for allowing us to come together. We're doing it in a different setting, but we all have such a love for wanting to come together and learn more about you. Prepare our hearts for that, dear Lord. Go with Pastor Ryan as he brings the message that will touch someone's life today and, and bring healing to our hearts and, and minds. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Becky. That last song was a, a commemorative hymn from 1876 on the 100-year anniversary of our nation. It's pretty cool. It's got a great message to it. A 12-year-old accidentally killed one of his family's geese by throwing a rock at it. But he thought, you know, we got 24 of them, so maybe mom and dad won't notice if I just bury it. So he did. But the unfortunate thing was his older sister saw the crime. And so she told him, I saw what you did, and I'm going to tell mom, unless you wash the dishes for me. So that boy wound up washing the dishes for the next few weeks until one day he'd had enough, and he said, you do them. And she said, I'll tell mom. And he said, I already told mom, and she forgave me. I'm free again. There's nothing worse than the worrying that comes from wondering what's going to happen to you because of something that you did. Maybe the only thing worse is being at the mercy of your older brother or sister. We all like, dislike that uh, oppressive weight of guilt and, and obligation, but we love the feeling of being freed from it. We celebrate July 4th every year as our Independence Day, the day that our colonial forefathers declared our freedom from Great Britain and got us out from under the yoke of oppressive British taxation without representation. And two centuries later, our government representatives say, we can oppressively tax our citizens with representation. Thank you very much. We fiercely value freedom in this country. And yet we, we too often seem to confuse or forget what freedom really means. The world's definition of freedom is something pretty close to being able to do whatever you want. But we're, we're obviously bound by a lot of things. We're, we're bound by such things as natural law. You know, you're not free to fly like a bird or like Superman or choose to be invisible or have superpowers or to make a square circle. You're not free to do those things. We're also bound by the law of consequences. So we're not free to choose an action and at the same time choose not to experience the consequences that flow from that action. And no less than Thomas Jefferson, one of our founding fathers, who was said to be more of a deist or an agnostic than anything else, he nevertheless understood how crucial a Christian understanding of liberty is to our exercise of freedom in this country. And his words still cry out as a warning to us as we see the fabric of our nation being torn apart all around us. Here's what he said. And can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God, that they are not to be violated but with his wrath. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. How much more would Thomas Jefferson be trembling today? True rights must be tempered with personal responsibility and moral guidance if they are to be freedoms. I don't know how many of you guys are going to identify with this, but I remember that we always have a lot of people watching and listening in different ways. So I'm going to throw it out there anyway. The Beastie Boys had a famous song back in the 80s. It was 1986. The chorus of that song was, You've got to fight for your right to party. <laughs> Some people confuse so-called rights with freedoms. 
as though having the right to do anything equals freedom. But that's not the same thing. That's, I don't know, freedom's evil twin. It's a counterfeit. It's called license. But when you take license, when that's your guiding value of of freedom, that's slavery to fad, to fashion, to passion, to whim, to megalomania. And license is the dance of death. It's not anchored to anything solid. And that's how we can wind up in such a short time with pop culture that says that men should be able to use women's restrooms, but there's no concern for the rights of the women in those restrooms. Because we're, we're also bound by the limitations of universal rights, and we hear about that all the time today too, our constitutional framers were brilliant when they chose to lay out only a small number of guaranteed rights that were still very broad in scope that they put into our Constitution and our Bill of Rights. Without that carefully considered focus, eventually my unlimited rights run smack into your unlimited rights, and one of our supposed rights is violated, typically with great hurt, great wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's impossible for someone to do anything they want without very quickly infringing on the rights and freedoms of somebody else. For example, this newly discovered right not to be offended conflicts with our long-established right to free speech. It is not popular speech which needs protection. No one's trying to remove it. It is precisely unpopular speech which must be protected if true speech is going to be protected regardless of which political party is in power. Otherwise, whichever party is ruling at the time gets to decide what's okay or not. And that's called socialism or communism or despotism. Take your pick. It's not freedom. It is worth noting, however, that you do have the right not to be offended by something that is offensive. Think about that for a minute and apply it to your life. We live in a world where most people do not know or understand the real freedom available to them. Even as many people playing as adults insist that they are or should be free to live their lives however they want, they still live as slaves to the world. They're not free of their fear and uncertainty and anger. They're slaves to their victimhood, slaves to desiring comfort and convenience, slaves to other people's manipulation and expectations. But there is a more certain form of freedom. Do you realize that we as humanity were created free? until sin enslaved us. From the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology, it says freedom or liberty is not that we can choose, but what we choose. Freedom is not then a status, but an achievement. We were created free. We choose sin and therefore choose to be enslaved to it. God offers us another choice. Freedom in Christ. The freedom of the Christian is a divine gift. It's a a fatal delusion to confuse ability to choose with this illusory right to choose as we please. All choice is an obedience to some God. Christian freedom resides in obedience to the only God in whose service is liberty. The human predicament that we all face is that we have an uneasy awareness of the divine pressure for obedience to God's law without finding within ourselves the resources for obeying it. The good news, the gospel 
is that God himself opens the way for obedience through faith in Jesus Christ. Christian freedom, then, it's a coin with two sides. One, we have freedom from human disability and enslavement to the devil. But not just freedom from, we also have freedom for. Freedom for striving to know God and to do God's will. We can seek to do what God commands, but we can't do this until we've been freed from sin. Galatians 5, 13 and 14, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. In 1 Peter 2.16, live as free people. <coughs> but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. The Old Testament's paradigm of freedom was revealed through the Exodus narrative. As God liberated his people from slavery in Egypt so that they could worship him and serve him. Egypt's economic, social, and spiritual oppression of Israel hindered this worship. And it prompted God to act on their behalf. In addition to political freedom, the people of Israel longed for other freedoms, freedom from other conditions such as sin and disease, uh, economic distress, even death. According to the Old Testament, God made provision in the law for dealing with some of these things. But the reality of death especially still hung over God's people. The psalmist, Psalm 89, 48 says, or asks, what man can live and never see death? Who can deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? Many Old Testament words related to freedom concern liberation from slavery, from moral obligations, from legal responsibilities, uh, or even economic distress. Generally speaking, freedom describes the release from, from any or all of those conditions. But when we come to the New Testament, the New Testament still reflects those same ideas, but there's a noticeable shift in focus to freedom from sin and death as accomplished through Christ on the cross. Galatians 5.1 for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. His death has loosed or released the believer from the bondage of sin. Romans 6, 17, 18. But thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin, you who were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. And Revelation 1.5 is penned to him who loves us, Jesus Christ, and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Here's the dirty little secret that the world doesn't want people to know. We were all created to worship and serve God. And anything else that we choose to worship and serve other than God is misplaced and sinful and it has consequences because it is not in God's created order and it is therefore not in our best interest either. So first, we need freedom from during the, the 14th century, there was a king named Reynald III. Well, sorry, he was a duke. Reynald III, um, and he was a duke in the area that's Belgium uh, in this day and age. As the result of a violent quarrel with his brother, uh, his brother Edward successfully revolted against Reynald. And when he captured Reynald, he built a room around him. And it had windows and it had a door, and he promised him that the day he left that room, his title, 
and his property would be returned to him in full. The problem with this arrangement was that Reynald was grossly overweight. And I find myself sucking in my belly as I say that. He was grossly overweight. He couldn't fit through any of the openings in the room. Reynald needed to lose weight before he could leave the room. And Edward knew his older brother couldn't control his appetite. So just to help, he sent him delicious food every day. What a nice guy. And as you can imagine, not only did Reynald not escape, he grew fatter during his time in that room. Anytime someone would accuse Duke Edward of treating Reynald cruelly, he would always respond, my brother's not a prisoner. He can leave whenever he so wills. Reynald stayed in that room for 10 years and wasn't released until after Edward died in battle. He was a prisoner of his own appetite. In John 8, 34, Jesus says, Everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. Just as Reynald was enslaved by his appetite, sin will enslave everyone who yields to it. We can become entrapped by almost anything that we allow to be our ultimate guiding principle. You've got people who seek after emotional highs, maybe through drugs or alcohol, sex, or even food in Reynolds' case. Most of those are just attempts to dull the pain of life instead of trying to understand it. They're chasing the next fix after each crash. Then you got those who try to find it in money. There's no security there either. There's never enough. They can get overextended. That can lead to, to every decision uh, hang, uh, hinging on how to pay the bills or what's going to make you more money, even if it's unethical or immoral. Then you got those who turn to philosophy, maybe religion, the, the free thinkers, so to speak. Those are all just attempts to avoid the reality that we are not the God of our universe, nor the author of our own salvation. Even those people, the, the free thinkers, they become enslaved to maintaining that illusion of freedom and authority at all costs, even when the truth makes more sense. In Christ... The believer is freed from servitude to both the gods of this age and the gods that we try to make ourselves. But we have another example to look at. We see the nature of the freedom Jesus gives as illustrated in some of his miracles. He calls the dead from death to life, just as the believer is reborn through water in the Spirit. He makes the deaf to hear, as the believer can now hear his word. <coughs> he opens the eyes of the blind, as the newborn now sees all the light of the word. He makes the lame to walk, as the believer now walks in his way. He cures bodily ills, as the Christian is freed for a more abundant life. He loosens the tongue of the mute so believers can sing his praise and share their witness. Yes, from Christ's miracles, they certainly illustrate the Christian's freedom from all sorts of things. But there is even more that Christ frees us from. He frees us from the crushing burden of suffering and hardship, not by removing the cause but by making our suffering a source for identification with him in his suffering for us. And by giving us meaning and purpose and opportunity for growth through our suffering. He frees the weak, the poor, the underprivileged from the, the gnawing agony of envy by equalizing all who hear his good news at the foot of the cross. And he draws the sting 
of physical death and the seeming triumph of the tomb for all who believe by the power of his resurrection. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You know, God knows what sin does to us. And so he has freed us from the sin that seems to so easily entangle us. Hebrews 12 talks about this, starting in verse 1. Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him endured a cross and despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God's throne. But freedom from is only the beginning of the salvation story for believers. We are also given freedom for. How do we get from freedom from to freedom for? God's divine law pressures us into acknowledgement of our sin. Romans 3.20 For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. We're pressured into acknowledging our sin and that drives us through repentance to Christ. Galatians 3 23 and 24. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Then, once we're liberated in Christ, the believer finds in the law the goals, the values, the purposes summed up in the word love. John 14, 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. It is this love, fully bound up in God's goodness and love, which weaves our choices into freedom. God has set before us the way of life as illuminated by his law. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And he gives us, through Jesus Christ, the gift of the spirit by whom we can be free. While the laws appear restrictive and, and they seem like drudgery to those who are perishing through them, they become a guiding light for the transformed believer. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. Sin entangles and seeks to master us. Freedom from the sinful entanglements of this world by grace and through Christ become in the life of the believer a blessed freedom for, by the Spirit and in Christ. We delight in seeking to walk daily in the light of God's Word, the very path which is illuminated being Christ Himself. And Jesus grants us by the Spirit the freedom to seek to do what God commands. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. True freedom then is that we can seek to do what God commands. James 1.25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, 
but a doer who acts. He will be blessed in his doing. You know, it's fitting as we're out here on a July 4th uh, weekend to remember that freedom always costs something, usually blood. The American war for independence against Britain cost the lives of several thousand American soldiers. Freedom was won for slaves in this country through the deaths of several hundred thousand soldiers. Several hundred thousand more American troops gave their lives to preserve freedom and to prevent the spread of dictatorships and Nazi socialists in World War I and World War II. We are blessed to live in a country where we have the political freedom to have religious freedom. And we should thank God every day that we are as blessed as we are. But many Christians around the world do not live in such politically free environments. And it begs the question, are they free? Some Christians are imprisoned or even became Christians while in prison. Are they free? John 8. Verse 31, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Are those people free? Praise God, yes. All believers are free in Christ through his shed blood. There is no greater warrior to aid us in overcoming addictions than the Holy Spirit. And you have freedom from your past. Jesus paid the price to cover all of your sins. You are not defined by your past. You're defined by Jesus through the grace of God. Our freedom does not depend on our situation or circumstances. It depends solely on the truth of what Christ has already done for us. And for who we are in him. John 8, 36, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. We're blessed to live in a country where we do still have some measure of political freedom. And compared to the condition of mankind through most of history, the United States is still an exceptional country in upholding our freedoms. That freedom is worth fighting for to preserve so that each person can worship according to the dictates of his or her conscience because we believe in freedom of religion, not freedom from religion. But even if we lose every single one of our political freedoms, even if we are unfairly persecuted, even if we're imprisoned, even if our very lives are threatened because of our allegiance to Jesus Christ, we will still be free in Christ because we are still free to live for him Paul says in Philippians 1:21 for me to live is Christ to die is gain as Christians Jesus lives every day through us our lives are living sacrifices for him even if my life be threatened for being a Christian even if my life be taken they give me to Christ And I will die for that reward. I pray for the strength to stand strong in his name should I ever find myself in that situation. And I thank God that I am free to die for him. And I pray that both my life of freedom and my death would be used by God for his kingdom and his glory. Just as the Exodus account pointed forward to Jesus the Messiah. So we and our freedom are sent to point others to Jesus as well. The New Testament emphasizes the believer's freedom is not for our own pleasure, but instead it's for the purpose of loving God and our neighbor. Galatians 5, 13 and 14, For you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. 
For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. For the sake of our spiritual freedom, as well as the freedom of others, we place boundaries around our own freedom. 1 Corinthians 10, 23 and 24, All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. The believer is no longer obligated to obey sin, but he's still not free of all external controls. Freedom is the state that emerges after God has acted to remove all hindrances, social, spiritual, sin and death, economic and institutional, all those things that get in the way of our creational purpose. That purpose is to know, love, worship, and enjoy God forever. That's a freedom that's been won for us by the death and resurrection of the Messiah. We can't forget that you and I are saved, that we have been freed for that purpose. John 17, 18, As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. By the power of the Spirit, the, the Christian seeks to live into this freedom and to join with God in freeing others. He sends us out with Christ's message of freedom to those who are still enslaved by sin. While we await freedom's full realization, at Christ's second coming. Take time this weekend to be grateful to all the men and women who have shed their blood to ensure the freedoms that we enjoy in this remarkable and exceptional country. Be even more grateful to your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who shed his own innocent blood so that you and I could be freed eternally from the snares of sin and death, free to be reconciled to a loving Heavenly Father, free to live a life of love for His glory. Heavenly Father, so, so much to be thankful for on this day, and it is so, so easy to forget that sometimes. Father, I confess my own discouragement lately at seeing what's going on in the world and in this country but lord i just thank you for every opportunity to remember your love and that i can trust you and that you have always walked with me through everything father i know that if we turn to you we can be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem and father i pray for the the strength it will take to do that for us as a church and for each of us individually Father, I pray for wisdom and discernment on the best ways to do so. And Lord, just help us to be a part of reaching people who so desperately need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ in this world. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to come together today. But I know that there are many, hopefully, who are listening to this message, maybe that are, have been listening to others uh, with all the content that's online now. I just pray that your spirit would be working through your word, uh, through your preachers, Father, in such a way to bring some to come to know Christ. And if that's you out there listening today, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, more than that, if you have not given your life to him, let today be the day. It starts with acknowledging that you are who God says you are. You are a sinner in need of a Savior. Every single one of us is. But it also continues by knowing that God provided that Savior in Jesus Christ. You give your life to Him today, the Spirit will begin working in you, and you will be free indeed. Father, thank you so much for such a beautiful weekend and this opportunity to come together. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, is there anybody here that wishes to participate in the Lord's Supper that still needs cup or wafers? If you do, uh, stick your hand out your window or honk your horn if you need that. Everybody's good? All right, good deal.
I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. It seems so fitting to be celebrating the Lord's Supper on a July 4th weekend. Knowing the blood that was shed for that freedom, knowing Christ's blood shed for our freedom. Let's take a few moments in silence to prepare ourselves for the communion with our Lord and Savior that we are about to participate in. A few moments in silence to search your hearts, to cleanse your hearts, and just to think about Him and what He did for us. So let's begin a word of prayer with that time of silence, and then we'll continue. Heavenly Father, we just pray that this time would be such a meaningful time to each person who participates. Lord, you commanded us to, to commemorate this until the day of your return. Father, we pray that you would find us faithful in that. Lord, we certainly want to remember you every chance we get, not just when we come together to celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper, but every single day, Father, in, in every moment that we give you as a living sacrifice. But Father, be a part of this with us today. Help us to just feel the, the power of the Spirit in each of us this morning, Lord. Bless this time. I pray it in Christ's name, amen. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he also took the cup and said, This is the cup, or this cup is the new covenant established by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance, as, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thank you, Father, for the presence of your Spirit here with us today. Thank you for Jesus Christ, for his death, for his resurrection, for his shed blood on our behalf. Father, just help us to, help us to be moved anew every time we think about it. Father, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all that you've done for us. And we just ask that we get to continue to be a part of glorifying you and giving back to Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. We had Father's Day books. We're, we're on to the announcements phase here. We had Father's Day books. If you were here for Father's Day um, and got to pick one up, awesome. If you are a man here, we would like for you to have one. So Dan, I think, has them on the way out. Um, they have actually, in some ways, kind of experienced an unintentional 14-day quarantine um, because they've been sitting in here for a little while, so they should be safe. Woo! So definitely pick one of those books up. He will also be collecting tithes and offerings on the way out as well, uh, if you need to do that. July 12th, our next service, next Sunday, will be another drive-in service, weather permitting. 
We will be honoring our 2020 graduates. We have five of them that we'll be honoring. I hope that you will all come and, and help us to uh, encourage them in, in their next phase of life and celebrate what they've accomplished to this point as well. Um, also, same day, July 12th, is our five-year planning workshop. We might, depending on numbers, we may try to do it in the pavilion. Otherwise, we'll do it in the fellowship hall. Please, 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 it is crucial that your voice is heard, all right, for what we're looking at doing and, and how we're trying to uh, live out God's purposes for this church in the coming years. So please consider participating in that. If you would, RSVP to Norma in the office, either through email or through phone. Also, <coughs> Last thing, the, the Alma Hunt offering, which normally starts later in the year, has actually begun early this year, and they are trying to target things that are kind of sort of related to COVID-19 areas. Um, so I just want to bring that to your attention as well when it comes to your giving, that Alma Hunt, we have begun to collect for that as well, uh, and we'll be doing so in the coming weeks. So I think that's what I've got for you guys. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. I pray for safe travels for everybody on the way home. God bless you and enjoy the rest of what a beautiful day the Lord has made. Thank you. God bless. Stand beside